Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is the first time that WSA is organizing a session which is going to focus on uh, professional development. And it turned out that uh, uh, the member of this panel here, uh, so Jay Wan Lim, who's professor in the School of Public Policy and Leadership at the University of Nevada, as well as Professor Elizabeth Mack from the Department of Geography, Environment, Spatial Sciences at Michigan State University, and Professor Daoshin Tong from the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University, we collectively decided that uh, the, the best use of the first professional development workshop will be to focus on something which is obviously quite important for uh, the youngsters, PhD students, and eventually postdoc, which is about uh, eventually getting some advice on how to uh, be successful when um, completing your job interview because uh, it is definitely an important step uh, in your career um, as a scholar. Uh, myself, I'm Sandy Dalerba. I work at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, as you can see here. So the way we have set this workshop is so that uh, I will uh, share here a few slides uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the attendees. And uh, the members of the panel are actually invited to be um, uh, stepping in at any time and share their point of view or their recommendation based on what I'm going to present. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to leave a little bit of time to make sure that uh, anyone who might have any question or comment among the attendees uh, will simply ask their questions and we will be super happy to be answering you. So let's get started. Um, the first element I'd like to emphasize is that uh, everything that will be covered here is not really coming from any textbook or uh, any um, manuscript that will really provide you with a clear guidance as to what to do. It's much more driven by personal experience, and that's why we thought that having a panel would be quite helpful so that we each can uh, share some um, ideas about what happened to our own cases. And the first element I'd like to emphasize too is the fact that when looking for uh, jobs, uh, it is a process that uh, definitely has to start quite a lot of time before your actual graduation. Uh, in my views and based on uh, my own experience, and, and it is also what I advise my students to be thinking about, uh, starting to consider uh, interviews and, and job is something that you might want to do roughly 10 months before graduation. So let's say that you are uh, expecting to graduate in May of year T, then you shall definitely start looking into jobs roughly around uh, September of October of the year T minus one. So it is definitely a process that uh, is time consuming. Uh, I compare it roughly to the time it takes to be writing one thesis of your chapter, of, uh, one chapter of your uh, thesis. Uh, so that's how much time I think that you must be prepared to be spending for that event, which definitely is uh, important for the rest of your career. So if I put it into the form of an actual schedule, as you can see here at the bottom part of my uh, slide, basically, you shall be in a situation where if you are looking for jobs in the academia, I'm more especially focusing on jobs in the academia, I have much less experience with uh, jobs in a private sector or for government. But if your uh, idea is to be considering jobs in the academia, you shall be considering the period of October of the year prior as a, a time to be uh, looking for uh, job vacancies and announcements. Uh, they often are open till January, roughly February, but by mid-January, traditionally, there is nothing new that will be advertised. The job interview uh, as a section, the, 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 the before events, uh, as well as during uh, the interview and after, are elements I'm going to cover in the coming slides. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, each of those steps one by one. So the first uh, points to consider, obviously, is where shall I be collecting information with respect to uh, where jobs are available? 
I provide you here in this slide a list of different uh, places which I recommend to my students too as a way of collecting information on jobs from many different fields which are common to the field of regional science. I have to uh, claim right away that those are for positions which are very much US centric. I believe that some of you might be uh, eventually coming from a different country than the US. And in this case, I would very much advise you to be uh, asking your own professors where to get information uh, about uh, jobs. Make sure you do ask this question very early on. But if it turns out that the US market is what you're interested in, whether or not you got your PhD in the US on the first place, here are the different websites that I think could be very interesting to you. Let's start with the first one on the top here. We're looking at the one of the American Economic Association. It's called Joe as a nickname. Uh, and it is quite clear, if you ever go to it, uh, you have access now to with, with a link, you will see that it really provides a fairly complete list of uh, what's available, not only in the US, interestingly, they also advertise about positions in foreign uh, countries. And uh, the focus is very much on academic jobs. Also, they every now and then have also some government positions which are uh, available on, on that website. Another one which is a little bit less um, uh, known, I would say, from uh, students in economics or ag economics is econjobmarkets.org. Uh, I haven't checked this one in a very long time. Uh, nor did any of my recent students tell me much about it. So I'm afraid that I cannot provide much more information compared to just uh, the, the name of the site here. There is one also which is focusing on business schools in particular. It's called academus.com. Uh, and I remember now, I haven't looked at it in many, many years, but I remember now that Academus uh, is a site that will advertise about uh, positions in business schools across different countries around the world. So even if the US market is not what you are interested in, you might want to look at uh, what uh, they offer here. Uh, eventually closer to uh, the people from this panel, uh, if you are coming from uh, a department of urban planning, uh, you might want to be looking at uh, the website of uh, the largest planning association, which is called the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. And they will obviously be advertising about a lot of positions for uh, this, uh, in this field uh, throughout the country. So does the American Ag Economics Association, AAEA. Every now and then they also post on the AEA website, but not always. In other words, as an economist, even if um, your focus is not exactly on agriculture per se, if it's uh, like for myself on more environmental questions or uh, climate change related questions, you might want to look into that. Uh, there are also several departments which are simply looking for an applied uh, economic, economist and they might advertise in this particular uh, website too. So make sure that if you are in a field of economics, you do not, focus, you do not forget about uh, the website of the American Ag Econ Association. All of those are free, by the way. I wanna make it absolutely clear. You do not have to pay any form of membership to have access to this information, which is of course extremely interesting. Um, there are a list of, uh, um, oh, let me skip that. I will come back to, to, to that in a second. And uh, we have here in the panel two uh, professors from the Department of Geography. So they are obviously quite familiar with what the largest association of geographers does in this country. It's called the AAG. They have on their website a set of uh, information for many different uh, elements, events, conferences, but they also have uh, a, a few uh, pages which are uh, definitely focusing on uh, looking uh, for jobs. The point I was about to make with Crenet is that um, Crenet is actually a listserv. You might want to be considering uh, some listservs uh, specific to your field. Uh, registering for those is entirely free. 
Uh, what I'm trying to explain is that every now and then there are some positions that are advertised on those list, list serves, which eventually are not uh, following the regular cycle I was speaking about in my previous slides. So if you want to be aware of those, make sure that at some point you put your name into that uh, list serve and get news from them on a regular basis. The news are not always about jobs. It will be about other elements going on in that field, but every now and then it will be about jobs. One more field to be considering, which I think is sometimes overlooked, is all the fields which are related to government affairs or a public policy institute, public policy departments, and so on. I'm not aware of any specific place where um, uh, the positions in those areas will be advertised, nor am I aware of a particular listserv which is specific to those departments of government affairs and so on. And they tend to rely a bit on the websites that I have listed above, but you still want to eventually check that more carefully if you are yourself graduating from a department of public policy or government affairs. So make sure you yeah, speak thank you. Uh, with I mean, people in your field. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, so uh, as you pointed out, some of those public policy institutes, their jobs are not as huge as the academic jobs, definitely. But one example is uh, Brookings Institute based in DC. And in our college, we have uh, Brookings Mountain West, and then they actually hire PhDs, and then they hire some research associates. And even with a master's degree, and while you are doing PhD, you may have a chance to work as an intern, research intern there. So if you sign up for the newsletter about jobs and some of research uh, papers and reports, you will be updated with that. And also, Liz just uh, typed it in our chat. Uh, I want to invite Liz to, I mean, she added, you know, some other sources as well. Liz? Thank you, Jaywon. Yeah, the Chronicle of Higher Education, you can filter by different types of disciplines, and it might be a good idea to do a keyword search in case you're looking for um, an interdisciplinary search. One of the themes in job hiring now are cluster hires, and so they might be hiring for people that do work on sustainability, and to do that, they might need people from different disciplines, and so the Chronicle is a, another place to look. If you type in Chronicle of Higher Education, it will pull it up, and you can look right on there and find jobs from um, multiple disciplines. If you're also looking for, um, if you're interested in working at a particular place, you can also go to their website and, and search for jobs and, and see that that might be a way to find targeted hires or clustered hires um, or cluster, pardon me, cluster hires. Uh, but also feel free, you know, if you go to conferences to talk to people and that might be aware of upcoming opportunities as well. So um, it's something I hadn't thought about before, but looking at specific schools' websites might um, avail you of opportunities as well. Yeah. yeah, just to add the chronicle of higher education, as you pointed out, uh, you they developed a very good filtering system. So it's query. So you can search job by your keyword, but at the same time, you can confine the geographic location, if it is a foreign job or US, the bunch of different jobs. And the benefit of that website is you will see when it was originally opened, if it is unfilled. So it is very uh, critical information if a certain job in a certain institution that you're interested in university, it was open two years ago, they still didn't fill the position. There gotta be a reason for it, right? So if you think you're the best fit and there is a higher chance that you get, you know, you will get invited as a candidate at least. So that's one thing. And the, another part that I want to add, since Sandy mentioned the uh, uh, different disciplines, I'm in the School of Public Policy and there is a, a, a association organization called NASPA, N-A-S-P-P-A. That's a network of schools of public policy and yeah, let me just be more specific about yeah schools of uh, public policy, and I think and it's a much bigger uh, job market compared to regional science. So definitely, you need to find some you know opportunities through the bigger job market uh, opportunities in the other disciplines because you know, regional scientists can be you know fitted in so-called multidisciplinary field, and also added in our uh, chatting box. NARS, NARS, the North American Regional Science Council, they have a little link for the positions, uh, I think openings, yeah, position openings. So you can find the recent job, but that's not only the, yeah, mostly the academic jobs, but they're sometimes looking for 
not entry level, but you know, you will see what's happening in the job market and the related field of regional scientists. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, I think it is closely related to the last link I was offering here in that in that slide. Absolutely. That's good. Eventually, G1 put the name of that uh, association you just spoke about in a, in a chat so that everybody can keep track we'll of that. Uh, the, the link. name and so on. The link. Yeah. OK, so uh, let me see here. For, oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Applying for jobs. Let's uh, discuss uh, this for a minute, because obviously, once you have now uh, collected the information about uh, places that you feel are um, good fit for you, you're going to have to be uh, applying for, for, for it. Okay. Uh, first comment, as you can see here in my slide, is um, based on the geography. We, we just discussed it uh, that eventually, you know, you might be considering uh, a specific part of, of the country for personal reasons or uh, you simply like the climate of a place. Um, in my very humble opinion, I tend to favor if you are in a situation of being a, a PhD student or postdoc to be, uh, make, to be making sure that you are not too restrictive about uh, the place on a, on, a, on a first place. In other words, uh, even if you might have some very strong ties with a particular area of the country, you might want to still broaden your search at the very beginning because you're not necessarily at the early stage in a situation where you can be too picky as to where you're going to end up uh, working. And uh, definitely securing a position is, in my view, much more important than uh, deciding that you're going to be absolutely staying in a location for, for whatever reason. So I will tend to favor making sure that you broaden your search uh, as, as wide as you can. Of course, given some limits, if there is some places in the middle of nowhere you definitely don't want to be uh, working in, then that's it. You simply don't apply. But just do not be too restrictive with respect to uh, the geographical locations you're going to be uh, applying to. Then you have to write your application letter, and that is definitely tricky because at the end of the day, it's it's a it's a, a statement of uh, roughly two pages that is going to convey a lot of information. You have to basically indicate who you are, what you do, how good of a match you are with the the positions they're offering, and there is obviously quite a lot of, at stake. So make sure, number one, that uh, you rely on eventually um, previous examples of uh, application letters. Uh, verify with your uh, advisor whether he or she might be willing to be uh, sharing an, uh, an example of an application letter. Uh, make sure also that you have more than one person read your letter ahead of time. Uh, you want to avoid any form of typo. You want to make sure that it is easy to read and it's pleasant. Um, and at the same time, as uh, you uh, decide to work on that application later, make sure that you are really updating your CV, okay? Uh, how many publications you've had recently? Is there any new activities in terms of price, conference participation, you name it. Um, when it comes to what is expected of a candidate uh, when applying for a job, it is, very, it is very much specific on each department and field. I put here an example uh, just to show you that uh, even in my own department, and I've been part of uh, um, job committees over the last two years for, different, uh, for two different positions, it will really range from candidates who did not have a single publication yet up to a candidate who already had five publications and he was about to finish his PhD. So I will obviously more lean towards someone who has had more publication. But it doesn't mean that we necessarily disregarded uh, students who did not have one complete yet. Uh, but obviously, the more publication you have, the more evidence you have that you have been able to complete the job because Publications at the end of the day is what uh, you're going to be evaluated on when you are on tenure track. So the more you've been able to already secure that process to completion, which is to really uh, up to the point of publication, the more I think the committee will be willing to be considering you as a very strong uh, candidate uh, for, for the job. Okay. 
In that letter of application, so make sure you obviously cover the different publications that you have, and make sure also that you are explaining clearly how good of a match you are with the department that is opening that position. One way you can actually indicate very strongly that you are a good match is by making sure that you are using some of the keywords that appear in the job announcement. So if they are speaking about someone who's a very strong on questions of, let's say, environmental sustainability, you want to make sure that the words environmental sustainability do appear in your letter. Okay, so basically you use some of those keywords in your application later. Uh, and it will be, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Liz has a point. Uh, Absolutely, Liz, Liz. yes. Thank you, Jaywin. Um, I was going to mention that um, for your application letter, make sure that you personalize them and, and Sandy is talking about this right now, personalize them for the institution. And something that happens really frequently is people forget to change the name of the institution. And so you get a, so this is something funny, but you don't want it to happen to you where you're reading a letter and they say, oh, I, I would love to work at Harvard. And you think, oh, well, we don't work at Harvard. And so make sure um, all the tips that Sandy are, is giving you are really key and to proofread and, and personalize it for every institution. So um, to do this, it's a good idea to print it off and to read it to make sure that you don't make that typo and if you're going through and talking about the classes you'd offer and that sort of thing, it helps to avoid this, but yeah, triple check before you, you hit send. And then also on the publications, um, Sandy mentioned that more publications tend to be better, but I'd say that's up to a point because I've seen, um, um, with respect to the CV, I'll mention three things and then hand the floor back over to Sandy. Make sure that you're organizing your CV appropriately and that you're not merging categories. This is something that can really frustrate reviewers that um, people that don't have papers, people try and put you know, presentations up into the paper section. And this is something that we see right through. So make sure that you're organizing your application or your CV accordingly and you're not trying to put things in categories that don't belong. This will frustrate rather than convince your reviewers that you're a good um, person for the candidate. Um, also, um, if you don't have publications, sometimes it's good to put some that are in review to show people that you're being productive, but don't put too many because this gives the sign that you're desperate. So um, put something that maybe is a revise and resubmit, that type of thing if you don't have any publications, but if you have 10 things you know, in preparation, that doesn't really mean too much. If it's something is in review, okay, but if it's, you, know, you show 10 articles in preparation, this can lead to the sign that you're desperate rather than productive. And lastly, um, the number of publications will vary by discipline quite a bit. So please make sure that you're reaching out to people to understand you know, where you stand and, um, and that will give you a sense. So geography, they tend to have more papers, but um, again, if you have too many papers or are doing strange things with your CV, this can be a warning sign rather than a good sign to the committee. So thank you, I'll leave it there. And just to add uh, Lee's points about under review, in development preparation. And you're right, as long as you have one couple of already accepted or in print or published article, don't forget to include those under review and in preparation, because that is a good, you know, the, you, you should demonstrate the, what you have in the pipeline for the good trajectory. So that can convince your employer and your, the institution that you're applying for, because the main goal of uh, the institution who, uh, which decide hire you is to make you successful academic professional and faculty members through the uh, academic career development in their own institution. Nobody, I, I know people are concerned about, you know, and then freaked about this tenure and promotion as an assistant professor, but they're there to help you to grow together with their program. So you have to keep that in mind. What can I show for the next three, at least until the mid uh, tenure review during your third year, oh, can I show them as a job candidate, I have things to work on for the next three years. I think that's very important. Yeah, can I weigh in here a little bit? Yes, sure. So, I think Sandy has provided very good guidance in terms of what to be included in the application letter. So I just want to add one point. Um, so it might be also helpful to like seek some support from your peers or from faculty members 
to see if you can get some successful application letters. Uh, so, so that you have some general idea about, okay, what to write in your field and, and what kind of um, what kind of selling points you need to include in your application letter. So I just, it just reminded me of my case when I was on the job market, when I was a graduate student, actually I was talking about my application. Then actually one faculty member, so I think faculty members are super nice. So one of the faculty members just sort of offered to, to send her uh, application letter so to me. So that was very, very helpful. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so other elements that I thought could also be uh, mentioned in, uh, in, uh, in that later is um, very briefly, you might want to indicate where you think your uh, future research is going to go, what direction. Make sure you keep that short uh, because, um, uh, you know, that letter is uh, roughly two pages. Don't make it too long. Uh, and you might also want to indicate uh, the name of uh, some of the people in the department that you feel could be very clear collaborators. But you might want to be uh, careful with that step still, because it could very much be that those people are simply not in uh, the, um, the committee, which is looking at those applications. So you might want to say that, but make sure you don't indicate by no means. So those are the only people you will work with, okay? You want to be very collegial. Uh, and then you will also be in a situation where you're going to be asking um, from maybe two or three referees, uh, professors, uh, to be writing a, a reference later for you, a recommendation later. Uh, so myself, when I was in that position of asking for someone for help and, and for that recommendation letter to be, to be written, I, will f I always felt extremely bad about it because I knew I would be consuming a lot of time from other people and something I hate to, to ask for. It turned out that now that I'm in the opposite situation whereby I'm actually writing letter for, for my students, uh, it turned out that the process is not as time consuming that I, uh, as I thought on the first place. In other words, of course, uh, you still want, I still have to be spending quite some time to provide some uh, useful and thoughtful remarks for the students. But in reality, if a student is asking me to write a letter for one institution versus 15 inst institutions, there is very little difference in time. It is really the first Later, that is consuming a lot of my time because I have to provide those arguments to convince the committee that the student is really good. But when, uh, when the letter has to be sent to the next institution, at the end of the day, it is just a matter on my side to be changing appropriately the name of uh, the institutions. That's pretty much it. I'm going to be convey a very similar message all over the place. But anyway, if you are in the same situation as I was myself as a PhD student where I felt so bad about using someone's time, uh, you might want to use the strategy I use, which is to send each of my referee a box of chocolate so that I felt a little bit less bad about having, using, having been using so much of their time. OK. Let's have a look about uh, the rest. OK. Um, let's speak about now the job interview process. So let's assume at this stage that uh, you found uh, several positions of interest, you have sent your application, and they seem to like uh, what you are about to offer. Depending on the field that you are in, uh, there might be what is called a pre-site interview. So the pre-site interview is very common in the field of uh, economics or agricultural economics. That pre-site interview is very often taking place at the early January meeting of the American Economic Association or American Social Science Association. And uh, by the way, uh, regional science is going to be part of this association starting this coming January. Uh, so we might host uh, 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 interviews related to our field uh, there. And it is a kind of a weird event, to be honest with you. Uh, I was in, a, in a two situations of being a candidate applying for the job many years ago. And I was recently in a position of being uh, in a committee interviewing students. 
And uh, on both sides, it's kind of weird. Why is it weird? Because quite often, those interviews are taking place in a hotel room. Quite often, the hotel room that has been reserved by the head of the department that is interviewing the candidates. So I always found it very strange to be interviewed by uh, people of, of such a formal process, which is taking place in a room where you literally see the bed, uh, where the department head has been sleeping uh, the night before. You can see the night table and everything. So it's kind of strange. But anyway, it's an event which is very common. So you have to make sure that you are prepared for it and you do well. Traditionally, we're looking at this stage, even for the field of Econ or Agicon, at a short list of candidates, which is somewhere between 12 to 15 candidates. Just to give you some perspective, last time we opened a position in my department, there were more than 100 applications for that uh, positions. So at the stage of that pre-site interview, we interviewed 15 candidates. And uh, the process is uh, very, very fast. Uh, it's roughly half an hour for each candidate. It's a process which is split over uh, more, more than one day, obviously, but very quick. In half an hour, basically, you're going to be uh, uh, in a position where you have to answer a set of questions, and I'm going to show you what they were, uh, uh, what are the questions that we used last year in the next slide. And if for some reason you cannot do it in person, uh, for some, in some cases, it just happened. We had a, an example of a candidate uh, located in the UK, so he did not feel comfortable buying such a, a trip to the US just for half an hour of interview. So we did the interview with him by Skype. Uh, so do not be shy about simply indicating for some reason you cannot do it in person and you will do it by Skype and Zoom, right? Uh, it's, uh, you're not going to be discriminated upon if that is uh, the situation. Um, for the field of planning or geography, I'm a little bit less aware of that. I do have the suspicion that you do not do any form of pre-site interview such as this. Can you guys confirm? my uh, my point here is yeah um based on my experience there is a, another huge association called the urban affairs association i was in their meeting in ucla campus and they do have a meeting facility there it was two years ago and it's a huge meeting and they do have this job interview i mean precise interview opportunities and other relatively bigger disciplines like a ge geography and also public policy schools, public affairs, public administration, they usually have this. But you're right, regional science and planning. I don't know. I mean, I might be wrong, Liz or Bao um, Chin. What about AAG? So as far as I know, they have some sort of you know, prearranged, pre-site uh, interview is going on with the AAG. Yeah, it, it really varies with the, the departments. Uh, so we don't, um, as far as I know, we don't really have some official interview kind of thing going on at AAG, but but they, it could be that if some departments are in, interested in certain candidates, they may stop by at your talk. So they want to know better about your research and the way you do the presentation. But as far as I know, and sometimes they will arrange meetings at AAG so that they will, I mean, departments will, uh, people, faculty members from the department will get the chance to, to have some brief briefly chatting with you. But uh, in terms of official interview, I'm not aware of that. So maybe Liz, you can comment a little bit on that. Uh, well, yeah, thank you. One more point that I want to add, even some academies associations like WRSA or NARS, uh, which we usually don't offer this like uh, precise interview, but I've seen some cases, uh, you know, from an institution that are looking for a job candidate, they have it and they have it in their plan and they see the program. And let's say I happen to participate in the uh, NARS meeting, okay? And then I saw some of those potential candidates, instead of reaching out uh, via email personally, I go to that meeting and then be in the session and then listen to the presentation. And if you really like his or her presentation and the topic, at the end of the session, we may have a quick, you know, the personal interaction, okay. Uh, why don't you apply for why we have this job opening or why don't you send me the full paper and that's another informal but you know potential way of you know getting to know people in the uh, who is hiring yeah to comment on the AAG piece i think it's um it typically occurs too late in the job season it's it's about april so the job season has largely passed however um 
we can talk about postdocs, which is fairly common now in geography towards the end of, of our session here today, but it might be an opportunity to interview people for postdoc positions, or you might get asked to do that. So um, I'll flag that for a future conversation and hand it back to CIP. Yeah, but okay. uh, Liz, uh, can I just ask you one quick question? Since you talked about the postdoctoral position, I got some requests from the international student who's joining this meeting, WRCA, because most of those international students are interested in postdoctoral position. Okay. They do get their uh, final degree from other foreign institutions. And first of all, do you think it is possible for them to apply for their jobs? And then what would be the good strategy for them? Um, I have a postdoc position that just closed. It might reopen. Um, yeah, so I would, There, a, a lot of postdoc positions are posted through NARSC. Um, AAG does it. So a lot of the outlets that we've talked about, um, postdoc positions are available and you apply similar to the process that Sandy is describing. And there is an interview and, you know, there's a whole search process for for you, um, if you're an international student, you do have to get an H-1B visa and there's a, a visa process. And so, you know, should they approach you with an offer, that would be the time to ask about, you know, the visa process, but they would certainly help you do that. And they're aware that they would need to do that if you're an international applicant. But um, much of the items that Sandy is talking about here today um, are relevant for postdoc applications. The postdoc season tends to be a little bit later, but not always the efforts for the position that we were advertising for opened in August. So if you know that you want to do a postdoc and that you need to work on your publications, which might be a sign that you maybe should consider a postdoc, that you need to up your publication game a little bit, then you know people can be looking now, a grant that just gets funded and they need a postdoc right away. Um, so don't, don't think that those positions aren't out there with the season that Sandy is referring to sort of October through January. But if you are looking for a postdoc, keep it open even until May because you know the postdoc season is much longer than the standard job season. Just one more quick point about the foreign national students. You're right, H-1B visa, they need to obtain the H-1B visa to work, but there's an alternative way always. J-1, which is also known as a visiting scholar visa, but I've seen many cases they're hiring postdoctoral foreign national PhDs or candidates through the J-1 visa. And that's a little bit more flexible than H-1B because H-1B institution or the employer should commit at least three full years, which is uh, a little bit more flexible with a J-1 visa. So there gotta be a way so you can always talk about that, you know, your uh, current status as a, uh, or national and then approach and send out inquiries and email and yeah, call them. That's a really good strategy for the foreign national students. Very good. Uh, so going back to that idea of uh, meeting your potential uh, future colleagues in person for the first time ever, there is one key element that uh, I think is really important to consider as you are about to enter the room. You shall, prior to that uh, interview, try your best to uh, have a better sense of who each person really is and a general idea of what each person work on. In other words, uh, in, in that room and in a, in a members of the committee, you're going to be looking at maybe four to five uh, people. It would be wise that you recognize them right away based on the information you've been gathering from the website of uh, the department and have in the back of your mind a sense of number one, the general field that they focus on. In some cases, even so they are part of the search committee, they may not necessarily be uh, very uh, uh, knowledgeable about uh, the exact uh, area that uh, is um, that position advertised for, which is totally fine. Uh, and you might also want to uh, make sure that you recognize right away who the department head is in, uh, in this group. Because at the end of the day, the final call is going to be uh, from the department head. So he, just be absolutely sure that uh, you are answering the questions of the department head calmly and very thoroughly, because he's a person who is going to do the final call on whether or not, following that precise interview, you're going to be invited to come on site. Okay.
So let's speak about that. So or, or before we speak about the on-site visit, sorry, uh, let's discuss first about the type of questions that that committee might uh, ask uh, from you. You're looking here literally at the questions that we used at the most recent uh, uh, job search uh, we ran uh, in my department. So the question number one was to have the candidate uh, describe briefly their research and their job market paper. It has to be brief because keep in mind that it's only half an hour. So um, you might want to actually train yourself ahead of such an interview to be in a position where you're going to be describing in roughly five minutes uh, what your general research is about, uh, the topic, the technique, what motivates it, you know, the big picture, and then you can go a little bit deeper into the story and what your contribution is. And it's a real exercise. Uh, some people call it the elevator speech. I think it's a little bit more than just the elevator speech because in five minutes you can cover slightly more, but make sure you also do not stick stuck yourself in a position where you are going so deep into the details that everyone in the committee is losing track as to why your topic matters. So I would very much advise uh, uh, for those of you who might be in that situation, to simply record yourself, videotape yourself, and be able to describe your research and job market paper in five minutes in a way that shows that you have a good control over your topic and that you are self-confident. Um, among the different um, candidates we had when we did that pre-site interview, you could really see that some were extremely nervous. Uh, and of course, it's an important moment of your career. We understand you'll be nervous and the member of the committee are not there to make you feel bad whatsoever. But you have to find a way to be somewhat controlling uh, your nerves uh, when you are uh, going through those five minutes describing your research and job market paper. The second element that uh, the, we used in that interview was um, based on having the candidate uh, explain the, the research that they think they will be doing uh, in uh, two to three years from now and eventually five to ten years from now. Just to get a sense of what the general picture is, what is the general direction of their field, uh, combining both topic and techniques. So it can really go in any direction. You don't necessarily have to, you know, hit some very specific points. It's just a matter of showing again that you have good control over the work that you've been doing during your PhD. And you have a sense of what questions are still out there. We never expect from anyone to have completely solved the question over the four or five years that your PhD might take, right? If you go, come into the interview and say, well, climate change, done deal, it's over, let's move on to the next question, people are going to be quite surprised. So you want to make sure that you are going to really indicate, well, I've done this uh, in my work, this is uh, question number one, and now next I intend to be doing this and this because it is important for those reasons you have to definitely demonstrate good knowledge about your field uh, combination of topic and technique. Next, uh, the questions that we had for the candidates was focusing on uh, why is it that they uh, are applying for this position. Um, when you do that, uh, the points that really made the difference between the candidates we ended up uh, selecting for the site interview versus the other, is for candidates that really showed very clearly they had done their homework. What I, what I mean by homework is that they actually spent some time into uh, on the website of the department looking at what it is that we are doing, uh, what are the kind of classes we're offering, what are the classes we are missing, uh, what is the general direction of the different uh, research themes that we have in a department. And in some cases, we were even surprised to discover that some candidates were aware of some university-level projects which were going on, such as, for instance, um, 
an institute which is focusing on environmental issues and which is trying to bring together different faculty members from many different departments or even colleges. So that's quite nice because that step here really indicates the, the candidate is really willing to be part of, of uh, uh, the, the, the unit. Uh, something you want to add or we're okay? Um, Next, if time allowed it, and in some cases the conversation was so interesting between point one, two, and three that we, for some candidates, we had no time to do points four and five, but just be prepared just in case um, there is some time left. In some cases, we ended up asking the students what courses they wanted to be uh, covering. Uh, so make sure that you have a sense of uh, whether you will be targeting your class at the graduate or undergraduate level, as well as general idea of what that class will be about. You don't have to come up with a, a you know, very detailed uh, idea of what the syllabus is going to be on, but just to have a general sense of uh, what technique or topic you might be interested in teaching. You can go up to the stage of saying, well, I think that I will be using that specific book uh, for the teaching. Uh, eventually, if you have been TA in the past, you have had experience of uh, really lecturing yourself. Uh, make sure yeah, you bring that up because the person we hire for those positions is not, some, is not someone who's going to only do research. We also expect that person to be a good uh, uh, teacher. So make sure you indicate uh, these elements. And in some cases, we even had the time to ask from uh, the candidates, uh, what are the challenges and successes they met uh, uh, in, uh, in a classroom in the past? Because uh, quite a large amount of the candidates we had at this stage had had some uh, teaching uh, assistantship uh, experience before. And then finally, uh, that's a very important point, point number five. That point here five is a deal breaker. F the committee will for sure, just before the end of the 30 minutes, tell you, do you have any question for us? And it's really a breaking point. Every single candidate who ended up having no question for the committee were someone who uh, were not um, accepted for the next round. Quite often, there was a very high correlation between a candidate not asking any question to the committee and how well they had done on points one, two, and three. So in other words, the very good candidates had questions for the committee. Make sure you do have at least two questions for the committee. So the typical question that we will expect from the candidates uh, at this stage of the process will be related to the timeline. In other words, you know, the candidate will be asking, uh, when shall I be expecting to have an answer uh, about uh, the next uh, round of the process? It's a very decent and open question. Uh, you could be asking uh, what is the type of support that you will get as a brand new faculty member in terms of uh, computing power, in terms of having some students that will be uh, working in your group, in terms of uh, how often would your um, promotion and tenure package be looked upon for feedback from more senior faculty members, things of that nature. You could also ask from the committee members uh, what the expectations are in terms of promotion and tenure. Um, it can be questions related to, uh, you know, how many publications are expected to get uh, uh, tenure, or, um, you know, uh, do I necessarily have to have be the best teacher in a full college to get tenure, or things of that nature, right? Make sure you do come up with at least two questions, okay? Uh, and there, I recall there was one case where the time allowed us to even speak about previous interaction between that one candidate and stakeholders, more especially if I remember well, because that one candidate had indicated some desire to do some extension work. 
Um, so it might happen if you have none, it's not a problem. We don't expect from uh, postdocs or PhD students who have done much along those lines, nor to necessarily have done much with respect to uh, funding from different agencies. At the same time, if you've been able to fund yourself as a PhD student, whether it's a Fulbright scholarship you got or an NSF or you name it, a scholarship, make sure you remind them because uh, you remind the committee members because it is quite prestigious at such an early stage of the process to have already been able to fund uh, your own research. And last point uh, I want to indicate before I move on to the next slide or let's let my colleagues uh, add some elements. None of those questions were given to the candidates at the stage. In other words, the candidates when entering the room had no clue on what questions they would be expecting. But I will say that in 90% of the time when I discuss with my uh, colleagues about the questions they ask at this stage, 90% of the time the questions are the one you're looking at here. Okay. Um, all right. Should I move on or is there any comments or remark yeah, on that? Just, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Go uh, yeah. So I think you said it had a very good point in terms of research and the questions to what you need to uh, ask for the committee. So I just want to add a few minor points. So for item number two, so what research we do, so basically you need to think about short-term trajectory and also a little bit long-term kind of a trajectory in your research program. And, and also the committee may also ask a question. So maybe some of your research might be specific to certain regions. So maybe you do a lot of application in your local area, or you collaborate with the local, a lot of with the local agencies. So, so the new university, so the committee may ask you, so what if you come to join us? So this is a different region and, and different study area. So how would your work apply to, to a new region? So just to think about those questions. And, and I think Sandy also commented that, so you need to think about what are the funding agencies you, you need to have for your research because a lot of universities do care about external funding. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I cannot agree more enough about the questions for the committee. So you need to think about some customized questions for this specific university. It just shows that you do, you do care about going to, going, join the, uh, going to join the university there. So I think that's my just a minor. Yeah, comment. you're absolutely right, Oshi. I think it's really a matter of sharing your excitement about going to that specific unit as opposed to, you know, I, I will do well in any place, right? That's not the attitude to have. You're, you're absolutely Sandy, right. Just a, one quick point, since uh, Dao Chin already brought it up. So when somebody asks what regional science is, it, we define, it's a definition by uh, uh, Kieran Donahue at Cornell. Regional science is problem-driven, interdisciplinary, and policy-oriented social sciences with uh, analytical approaches to urban, rural, or regional problems. So in that definition, multidisciplinary is very important part. Of course, it should be applicable social science. And our audiences out there is not just academia. It's a policy makers, a policy decision makers. So you put there like some questions, stakeholder interactions. That's really, really important because you may ask, oh, if I hired by your institution, who are my audiences? Do I work with the state and local government? And those are the really important uh, and chance for you as a regional scientist to highlight your work, your research and your professional work can be translated into their own words and then it can be used for your local region and state, uh, state, you know, your local and state region. I think it's very important for you to highlight it. To add one more point to that, Dao Chin already touched a little bit. Yeah, in my case, when I came here for my job interview, I did my uh, presentation about interregional migration and labor market analysis. And at that time, it was right in the, right after the 2008 uh, recession. So, Las Vegas and state of Nevada was still struggling with the delayed recovery. So the, in, I mean, the demography or the migration pattern was still struggling. And uh, my advisor, Jeffrey Hewings, uh, strongly advised me to prepare for the next week or so what's happening in the demographic shift in Las Vegas and in the Southwestern region. 
and I moved from Arizona to Nevada. Different issues, even though it is close enough in just neighboring state. So if you know the issues in your, especially if you're working for the state government, state, uh, state university, that's very important. You will have a lot of chance to work with the state and local government. So you should successfully demonstrate how your approach or topic or methodology can be applied to the current issues in the local and state. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Again, it's really about showing you want to be part of that unit as opposed to any unit. You're yeah. absolutely right. Okay, so, yeah. oh, sorry, you had you wanted to add something more? No? One last tidbit. Um, try and have brief, um, substantive, but brief comments to the questions that they ask. There's nothing worse um, having been on search committees to have someone go on and on and on to answers to questions. So please bound yourself and give concise but complete answers to the questions they're asking because you will annoy committee members if you go on and on. Elise, you, you are absolutely right. That's why eventually I will suggest the students to uh, record themselves, videotape yourself and make sure that uh, you're able to cover all those points in half an hour. Best way is to simply practice. You're, you're absolutely right, Liz. Okay, so let's assume now that everything went well and you are now uh, among the lucky few, generally only three at the most four candidates who happen to be invited on site. Uh, so you go, you're all excited about it and you obviously have to be doing very well for the roughly two or two and a half days you're gonna be uh, spending uh, with uh, your potential future colleagues. So a couple of uh, thoughts here with respect to how to behave uh, during, um, during this process. And as you can see from the top of my slides, there is even a bit of homework to be done uh, ahead of uh, meeting them in person. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is that now you're gonna be in a situation where you're gonna be meeting every single faculty member from the department. You will also get to know uh, the graduate students and, and the staff, but your focus will uh, mostly be, of course, on the future uh, potential colleagues of yours. So this is a stage where you have to spend a little bit of time on the website of the department to understand better who does what. And uh, that can be, of course, a bit overwhelming if a department is fairly large. Just to give you an example, in my own department, we are 38 faculty members. So how would you remember absolutely everyone, their name and their specialty is impossible. So what you can do, which is something I did myself as I was looking for jobs uh, you know, two decades ago, you have with you a cheat sheet. So that cheat sheet is basically a piece of paper you're gonna keep uh, close to yourself in your, in your jacket or in your pocket, uh, which is basically gonna be the program ahead of your uh, on-site visit. They're gonna give you a clear sense of who you're gonna meet, what day and at what time, such as for instance, having breakfast with Professor Johnson uh, that day. And then at 10, you're gonna meet uh, Professor Smith and so on and so forth. So what you can easily do is simply put a few keywords in your own printed version of the program about what each faculty member really do. And why would you do that? Well, the underlying idea is to make sure that as uh, you are going to get to know that person, you don't make any faux pas. And you might be in a, in a, in a position where you actually start the conversation by asking someone, oh, uh, Professor Johnson, I see that you are working on uh, spatial econometrics. Could you tell me a little bit more about that particular point? Or could you tell me more about, you know, what are your um, recent publications related to spatial econometrics? You, you want to do that as a way of conveying the message, as we just discussed uh, two minutes ago that you really want to be part of that unit and you actually want to be so much part of that unit that you already have done the homework of understanding what each faculty member does. You're going to really convey a positive image of yourself if you do that work prior to getting to know the people. You also have to be even more specific uh, about uh, what the research is for some very specific faculty member. And those are number one, the head of the department, 
And number two, the members of the committee, of the search committee. You have to know much more. Uh, you have to know a little bit more about their own research. And more especially, you have to be able to recognize them right away, based uh, hopefully on the picture uh, that is displayed on, on the website of the department. So now, little funny stories that literally happened to me uh, a long time ago, as I was invited on site at the University of Florida. Uh, it turned out that um, I go and I, on site and I'm invited for dinner and five people show up to have dinner with me that one evening. I'm able to recognize four of the uh, members of that uh, party. And there's a fifth one. I just cannot recognize that person. I just don't know who that person is. And uh, the uh, dinner goes on and goes on. And at the end of the dinner, I approach that person and ask him, by the way, who are you? That person was a department head. It turned out that the picture he had put of himself on the website was a picture of himself 20 years ago. And I did not recognize him whatsoever. So just make sure that in some cases, you might have done as much homework as you could, but there are still those little events that take place that unfortunately, uh, you had no control over. So if at any point during uh, the lunches or the dinners they uh, might uh, take you out uh, for, there is someone you don't know, do not do the mistake I did. Ask right away at the beginning of uh, the event to be introduced to that person, okay? Uh, traditionally, uh, the people are going to be invited one at, uh, they will for sure be invited one at a time. Uh, usually, uh, uh, each department tries its best to have all those interviews take place over the course of roughly three weeks, uh, because uh, you know departments and committee members are overwhelmed with so many other responsibilities. They kind of want to do it in a block and be done with it. And uh, you might be in a lucky situation where the department is asking you, okay, we have those three uh, different weeks uh, to interview uh, all of you which is your preferred option. In my view, you might want to be uh, the last person to be invited uh, in uh, this process. The reason why you might want to be the last person as opposed to the first one is that the final decision as to who is going to be given an offer is going to take place, obviously, after all people have been invited. And if you really do a good job, you might want to be giving a very good impression as closely as you can to the time when they are going to decide who is the person who's going to be selected. So by being the last person here, you have an advantage compared to giving the exact same performance, but being the first person to be invited on site. So if you're given that opportunity, I would recommend to be the last person to be invited. Okay, you will be given the schedule ahead of time, as I indicated to you. Um, you also will have a better sense, a very clear sense of how much time you're given to uh, give your presentation. Uh, make sure you don't make it too quick. Make sure you make don't make it too short. We had a case, for instance, uh, uh, during the most recent interview two years ago when a candidate was given an hour and 10 minutes to give the presentation, and after 40 minutes, he had nothing else to speak about. That is a terrible mistake. So make sure that you really uh, use the time appropriately, okay? And you might be in a situation where some people ask you some very strange question at the very end of your uh, presentation. It could be because they have their favorite candidate and it's not you and they just try to destabilize you. So just be prepared, that might happen. But uh, most of the time, the questions are still very professional, okay? Make sure that the presentation you give is something you have practiced a lot. There is often that belief among uh, PhD students that the presentation that you have to give based on your job market paper is basically the chapter of the thesis that you are currently working on. It seems to me this is a terrible strategy because at the end of the day, the committee is mostly here to be evaluating how comfortable you are with the research that you have been working on and how good is, that, uh, is the research itself. If you are in a position where you have already worked on several of the chapters of your thesis, 
um, I would recommend that you chose those uh, former chapters of your thesis as your job market papers. Why? Because it is uh, expected that by that time, those are papers that you have already presented multiple times, not only within your own unit, but also through uh, conferences. It is also expected that it's a paper that hopefully has already been um, uh, submitted for publication somewhere. So you might also have benefited from feedback back from referees and you might even be in a lucky situation where that paper is already taken for publication there is nothing wrong with a job market paper to be an already published piece so do not follow what i have seen uh, many many times uh, in the past where students assume the job market paper shall be the most recent chapter of their thesis basically chapter number three it's a very bad idea, in my opinion, because it's a chapter that you don't have very good control over. You haven't had enough experience thinking well about what uh, this chapter does. And a job interview is definitely not the time to collect feedback for improvement of your job market paper. I have seen that in an actual on-site interview where the feedback or the the, the, the comment that the candidate will say is, oh, thank you very much for all that feedback. I will include it in the next version of the paper. No, this is completely wrong. This is what you do when you present a paper in seminars. Here, you are in a job interview. You have to really show that you have very good control over, um, over the, the paper you're presenting, okay? And let me see. Uh, Oh, yes. And final point with respect to the presentation itself, it is much more common to be presenting only one piece uh, as opposed to um, as opposed to different pieces. Uh, make sure that you confirm this point uh, uh, from the head of the search committee, uh, because some of you might be in a situation where you have already more than one publication and you might be tempted to be presenting a bit of the first one, a bit of the second one. That's not a usual strategy, but you might want to uh, run that through uh, the head of the search committee. Okay, any comments from my colleagues on that? Are we okay? I would, um, I would emphasize that the last point Sandy just made, unless you've been told to give a broad overview of your research, yeah. you should focus it on one paper. This is a common error that people make, and I call it the death of the overview talk, where you try and cover three up to five papers I've seen, and you just do a slide per paper and people don't get a sense of the depth and the rigor of your research. And it comes across as very superficial. So if you wanna give people an overview, you can do it at the in opening slide. I do research on the following topics and I'm happy to talk about it at the close of you know, the discussion section and then get into your paper. Um, but it's such a common strategy that people try and do too much in one presentation and it's not successful. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I would. Um, agree. So just, just a few words. Yeah, go ahead, I, would, I cannot just. I, I think I would agree with the both Sandy and Liz. So you would like to show this paper, but also show the depth of the research, not just the the breadth of the research topics you've been working on. So just the depth is also very very important. That's the reason that a lot of times a, a, a department is interested in hiring you. Yeah, more especially in our field, you want to show that you have good control over a set of techniques uh, that uh, you are uh, specialized in. Absolutely. Uh, other elements, uh, make sure that you really behave from one plate to another. In other words, um, you're not only being evaluated for um, the depth of your scholarship, you are also being evaluated for being uh, an interesting person. So make sure you really have a very professional behavior from beginning to the end. It means that uh, you have to make sure that you are dressing uh, appropriately for the occasion. I remember when I was faculty member in Arizona, we had that one case of a, a candidate for the job who literally came with his shirt over his pants. Uh, you know, his tie, his tie was simply uh, not appropriate. He was way too relaxed. Uh, for the occasion, and that did not do very well for, for, for him. Make sure you also are very cordial with everyone, uh, staff members, students, because everybody is going to give their opinion at the, at the end. Once you're gone, an actual survey will take place, and everybody will be allowed to, to give feedback. So um, 
if for some reason a candidate has not been very kind to uh, staff members or uh, graduate students, they have the right to report it and it's not going to play well for, for that person. Um, let me skip over the business card uh, element, it's not that important. Uh, make sure that you keep asking a lot of questions also along the way. Um, well, for two reasons. Number one, faculty members love to talk a lot and they more especially love to talk about their research, uh, you know, what they're up to. So make sure that, uh, you know, you question them. And uh, if uh, they spend quite some time speaking about what they do themselves, uh, they're going to really say, wow, the conversation was wonderful. We spoke a lot about what I do, you know. Uh, so it's a little game that you may want to play. But it's also a nice way for you to be um, uh, showing that you are highly interested in the research of others and uh, get a sense of what the department is up to. And it's also a mechanism by which you might want to verify across different people that uh, the, the, the answers uh, are well coordinated. So for instance, Let's say that it's important for you to make sure that you are working in a very collegial environment. It's okay to be asking uh, one specific person, do you think that the department is very collegial? Are people supportive of each other? And then feel free to be asking the exact same question to a couple of other faculty members and simply see what they say. If they all answer to you, yes, it's a very collegial environment, then there is a great chance it is true. If maybe two out of three tells you, yes, it's collegial, and one says no, uh, you know, you might want to be considering that also because the point of a job interview is not only for you to get the job, is to also have you assess who are your future colleagues. And if it turns out that during that interview, you discover that it's not necessarily a great place to be working in, people are very competitive, for instance, well, you might want to think about it twice before you really uh, end up signing that contract, okay? Uh, so in order to address that list of uh, potential questions you might have, eventually uh, prepare your questions ahead of time, uh, not only for um, each individual faculty member, but make sure that you also have questions for the department head and for the dean. You can see I put it in bold. You absolutely need to have questions for those two. You're going to be brought to the dean uh, of the college uh, that your uh, unit belongs to, and you have to make sure that you also come in for, with questions. Again, as we indicated earlier, the underlying objective is to show that you have high interest in a unit or in a college uh, and therefore you shall be the person uh, that uh, shall be hired for, for the job. Very basic uh, type of uh, questions that you might want to ask the head and the, dean, and the dean are, what are the plans for the college or for the department in the next uh, five to 10 years? You know, in what direction are things going in the department or college? Uh, is there any uh, budget uh, constraints that we need to be aware of? Uh, are there a lot of... Uh, uh, endowments, uh, are there some support from the private sectors and so on, you might want to be aware of uh, those opportunities. And you might also want to ask uh, how long it's going to take before a decision is reached. So those are very basic open uh, questions uh, that you might want to choose to ask the head and, and the dean. Okay. Sandy, just one quick yeah. point. Yeah. Tell me. So in the end, Sandy brought up really good points about collegiability and then prove that you can be a good colleague for the next at least three years or five years, 10 years, because in the end, they are looking for a good colleague, not just a qualified candidate. So if you believe you're the, quali the qualified candidate, you should, be, you should be able to prove that you can be good friends working together and you can, be good, uh, you can bring in more collegiability to the program. And of course, you know, if you ask that question directly to the search committee members, you know, uh, is welcoming and if, even if you got disappointed because two out of three said now this is not necessary I mean they will never say that but you got the gut feeling but you know still you just prove that you can be good teammate and that you can be a good colleague and I think that's very important in the end they're looking for the good colleague and good means qualified plus good personality and then somebody who can they can easily interact with and open and then not only to the uh, search committee and faculty members, you're right, Sandy, uh, uh, staff members and grad students, a PhD student you will be meeting. So you should prove you know, who you are and then you're the good candidate for the good collegiability. Yeah, yeah absolutely.
And it goes in both directions. You know, they are evaluating you, but you also are collecting information about them. And at the end of the day, you want to be comfortable working in this place for the next five or 10 years or forever. Uh, so it's also a way for you to get to know them. A uh, quick uh, slide here, which is basically to give you a sense of what uh, your presentation uh, might uh, follow in terms of organization. Um, make sure overall, uh, overall comments, make sure that it's really targeted to the needs. So once again, make sure that the keywords that were part of the job announcement do come up somewhat regularly in your presentation and make sure you control your time well, as I indicated earlier. But here's a basic uh, structure of what that presentation might end up being. Start obviously with the title of your work, your name and your affiliation. And then you're gonna cover many slides about uh, your research as Liz indicated earlier. Uh, if you have several pieces out there, eventually the first uh, from slide two to slide say five, you might want to say, okay, I've been working on those other elements um, and uh, that's not exactly the focus of my job market paper, but be aware that it's also something I'm interested in and you might be uh, quite uh, quick on those. Then really comes the, 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 the bulk of your presentation where you cover your topic and the different techniques. You are thorough in terms of your conclusions and the implications uh, for the future. And then eventually, it's not an obligation, I, I recommend it to my student, the very last slide, and just in one slide, you might want to indicate elements such as what your future research direction might be. It's a nice way of actually uh, connecting with uh, many people in a room, right? Eventually, they might not necessarily relate entirely with your specific research or techniques, but by uh, you know indicating what your future research directions might be about, you might be able to reach out to a larger number of people. You might want to remind everyone very briefly what uh, your publications have been, uh, because the last slide, uh, you know, it's often the slide that stays on the screen as people are asking questions. So that last slide is quite important. You know, it's, uh, it's going to be eventually the one slide that is shown most of the time to your audience. You might want to also indicate clearly um, and briefly, for sure, uh, if you've been an uh, RA or TA uh, during your uh, PhD time, if your uh, work was funded, uh, if you have been uh, the lucky recipient of an NSF doctoral research grant, then it's wonderful, it's very prestigious. Make sure you indicate that. And if you happen to have had some interaction with a stakeholder, um, you might want to say it briefly. So I realize now that it might take more than one slide. So, um, And you might also want to simply indicate, well, I think the courses I would like to, to teach are those. So why doing that? Well, it's because the members of the search committee very clearly will have read your profile very closely, but there is a very high chance that the rest of the committee of the, the members of the departments are basically learning uh, about you and learning about your work for the first time through that presentation because they are not part of the selection committee themselves, or maybe because they have so many other things going on, they just did not have the time to look carefully at your profile. So you could be using those last slides here just to remind everyone those different elements. And then one element I'd like to emphasize is actually based on the most recent experience too I've seen. Uh, we had the candidate on site who for his very last slide decided to quote the work of one faculty member of the department. What he doesn't really know is that uh, this particular faculty member is someone I would call uh, a bit of a problematic uh, colleague, someone who unfortunately uh, is uh, simply not the most collegial colleague ever. So that really played against the candidate and it's really not the candidate's fault. He must uh, not be very much aware of uh, what is the general impression of the department on that one uh, colleague. So just avoid quoting anyone in particular in the department. You wanna show that you have interest in broad collaboration with absolutely everybody from the departments. Okay. Uh, let's continue with elements which are taking place on site. Uh, you're gonna be invited for a breakfast, for lunch and for dinner. Uh, at dinner, it is not uncommon that some of the members of uh, the, your party might be uh, willing to have a beer or uh, to have um, a glass of wine. 
simply because it's also time for them to, to relax after a long day of work. Uh, in this case, you are under no obligation whatsoever to, to drink. Uh, if uh, you are simply not uh, drinking, usually do not feel obliged to be uh, taking uh, any alcohol at this moment. But also be aware that if you decide to have just a beer or a glass of wine, it's not going to play against you. No one will look at you as uh, being, uh, you know, dependent on alcohol of any form. Of course, if you are in a situation where no one else in a party is ordering any alcoholic beverages, I would do not recommend you to be the only one doing so. Okay. Another element, which is that you're going to be given some downtime as you are uh, on site. In other words, quite often at the end of the day, roughly at around 4.30 p.m., there will be a break, uh, free time given to you uh, up to the moment of dinner, which dinner is quite often 7 p.m., something like that. So you are roughly given two hours and a half of free time. Um, in the early days, uh, salaries were not necessarily recorded on websites. Uh, some universities do it, it's public information. So for instance, for my university, it's uh, directly available online. But in some universities, it is not available. So what you might want to do during that downtime is to go to the main library and to request to have access to that information. It is public information, so even so you do not belong to that university yet, you shall be given access to that information. And it's something that you might want to be look to, to you might want to look into why. Because at some point, uh, the question of uh, the contract uh, will come uh, into play. And you want to be uh, in a situation where you have a ballpark park idea of how much an assistant professor from that particular department is receiving. So that whatever offer you are given on the first place is not way below what others in, uh, in that position are offered. You have some kind of a negotiation power you, you, you know, at the time of negotiating your, uh, your, um, your contract. Um, during the job interview too, it's okay if you as a candidate decide to speak about personal issues such as you, know, you have children, you're married, or uh, other personal issue, it's okay. But uh, by law, the member of the committee cannot ask you personal questions. Uh, they are not allowed to be asking you whether you are married or not, nor whether what your sexual orientations might be, or what is your religion, or whether you have children. They are not allowed to ask you directly. Now, they might come in a conversation, for instance, a uh, faculty member may discuss uh, issues related with their children, and then it's very much up to you to indicate you have children too, or if you have children and you don't want to speak about them, it's totally fine. So it's up to you to bring up those personal issues. Okay. If you are also in a situation whereby uh, you're married to someone who also is interested in having a position in the academia, and uh, what uh, the best uh, uh, option for the two of you will be a spousal agreement. So spousal agreement is basically uh, um, a case whereby one of the two spouses gets uh, the position and then negotiates for his or her spouse to become uh, the higher in, uh, in uh, either the same department or a different department. I will recommend not to bring up this point that early in a process because uh, in my views, it is still not very clear whether that's something that might play against you. In other words, you understand that a candidate coming alone is a specific budget, but a candidate that is right away indicating I am coming, but only if you are bringing my spouse along, the department head of that unit will right away be uh, in a situation where he or she will have to consider a slightly larger budget to make to fill this position. So in my view, it is if you are in that situation, it is something that you might want to bring at a later stage. Only once negotiation for your own case have taken place and you are completely fine with it, then you might want to bring as a story of bringing a spouse along the way. But I know that some colleagues of mine somewhat disagree with that approach and might prefer to indicate that early on. And to some extent, it doesn't play against you. We've had a situation 
uh, a few years ago, whereby the candidate from the very early stage, from the stage of the application letter, indicated that he will only come if uh, his spouse will come along too. They were in a situation where they belong to different universities and they were desperate to be working for the same university at some point in their career. So in this case, we knew about it and it turned out this is a person we selected. So it doesn't really play, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily play against you, okay? And as I indicated earlier, at the end of your visit, uh, as the day after you uh, left uh, the location, uh, everyone will be uh, in charge of providing feedback about the visit uh, to the department head and to uh, the members of the selection committee. Okay. Any any element my colleagues want to add or? I have just one more slide to go. Yeah, Are we Sandy, okay? just, just quickly, this is yeah. our last slide. And uh, there's uh, one more, one more after this one. Okay, but uh, just quickly, uh, the program says it ends around seven, but we started 10 yeah. minutes later, 10 minutes yeah. after the schedule. And also, we can stay another 10 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes for the questions, QA. Just want to let yeah. you know that will be over quickly. Yeah. Good. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, so last slide. Here we go. So that's after the interview. So you went back home, you did the best you could, and that's it, you're home. Um, I have seen uh, cases whereby candidates uh, decide to send a card, a physical card, or an email to, to thank uh, everyone in a committee and in the department uh, for uh, the, the time they spent for the, for the, for the candidates. I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, personally, I will not do it, but I have seen some people who uh, willingly do it. So it may be a difference in culture here. I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, I just find it a little bit strange uh, in my views to be sending that thank you not. Uh, I feel comfortable th sending a thank you not when I'm invited for dinner by some friends, but not so much when it comes to professional matters. But again, it might differ uh, across cultures. I'm not so sure on that one. Uh, then you wait until the decision is coming to you. Yeah, in other words, uh, if you are the lucky candidate uh, to be selected, the department head is going to contact you uh, by phone or by email and telling you, okay, now it's time to be uh, discussing the terms of the contract. And if it turns out that uh, the committee take quite some time, don't necessarily freak out. In some cases, the decision is hard to reach. Uh, it might be that uh, for some reason, uh, the budget was not completely there, so they need time, but it's okay as a candidate for you to sending an email, to be sending an email and simply asking if uh, you know you should expect an answer soon or not. Then will come the time to discuss the terms of your contract. Um, your bargaining power is fairly low if that's the only offer that you have. If you're in a lucky situation where you have more than one offer, then you might want to make sure that the different places uh, are aware of that situation so that, uh, you know, you could eventually be asking for uh, several elements. The salary is not the only thing that uh, you might uh, want to consider. You might want to verify very closely what is uh, the support for uh, technological uh, technological support that each of the two places might offer, the degree of collegiality of a specific place, as well as the geography, the climate, and so on and so forth. Do not assume that uh, everything uh, ends down to being uh, what the salary might look like. Um, there are different ways of discussing those terms of the contract, uh, either by email or over the phone. Uh, when I was myself in those situation, I always prefer to do everything by email because I could actually keep track of the back and forth going on between myself and the department head. And also because uh, I simply feel much more comfortable writing an email in a calm uh, about what my request might be. When you do so, make sure that you always share uh, and convey very clearly your excitement about being part of the department. So in other words, start your email by saying, oh, I'm so glad to uh, have been selected for the job. It's absolutely wonderful. Then comes the part where you discuss whatever you have to discuss and make sure that you end with something along the lines of, I so much look forward to being part of your department. It's a, a wonderful prospect or things of that nature. Once you have discussed the terms of, your con of the contract for yourself, make sure then if you are in a situation of having a spousal agreement to consider, you bring that up and you bring it up before you sign anything. 
In other words, as soon as you sign the contract, the negotiations end right away. Okay, you cannot be in a situation of signing a contract and then later on say, oh, by the way, it turned out I have that uh, beautiful husband or beautiful wife I want to bring along and so on. That's it. Uh, you know, the department has done what they had to do, which is to fill a vacancy. Whatever comes after that is not really much their problem. And keep in mind also that uh, nothing is official unless it is written in a contract. I heard of a situation in Arizona where a candidate selected had a verbal agreement with the dean with respect to some support that uh, she was expecting to get. It turned out that by the time that candidate comes on campus, the dean had moved to a new position and a new dean came along. When she brought that case to the new dean, the new dean said, I'm sorry, uh, it was just a verbal agreement between you and the previous dean. I have no written record of what you discussed. Therefore, I cannot honor whatever you had discussed. So if it's not in writing, it is not official. And with that, I Sandy, want to wish uh, all of you good luck. Yeah, Sandy, could you go back to the last slide? Absolutely. Yeah, I want to add one more final point. Yep. Especially, I want to rephrase your last point. Yep. No agreement is official unless it is written agreement. Yes, it is correct. But more importantly, no agreement is official unless you sign it. Yeah. So even if you get the written form of agreement prepared by your uh, you know, employer, you still have chance to change it, modify it. In other words, I'll, I'll share some of my experience because, you know, when I got the, well, I was not prepared, but, you know, I suddenly got a phone call from Dean directly, not from the department, head, department head. And then he started to talk about blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, you know, I, I of course, as Sandy <laughs> suggests, I showed my verbal excitement. Oh, I'm so excited. And there's a great chance for me, blah, blah, blah. And then he briefly talked about the salary. and that was uh, uh, that that met my expectation, but I wanted to have more bump or increase. So I thought I had a chance in the written form. But yes, they sent me the written contract about the money or the salary, base salary he mentioned, and I had to do more negotiation based on that. Because you know, unless you sign it, you still have room for. I mean, it, yeah you can raise it because you know the ball is on their court and then you show your interest. Oh, this is what I expected, but it's a little bit lower than I thought. And of course, they are desperate to hire the best candidate. You are the best candidate once you get the job offer. And of course, that's why you need to know how much other colleagues are earning, especially if you have some recent hire at the same rank, entry level assistant professor last year hired by the same department last year or in the same college. In the end, that decision about your salary is not your department head, it's a dean's decision. So you have a room for negotiation. You have to keep that in mind until you sign it, okay? Yeah, Jiwan, you're absolutely right. And one element I want to convey here is, uh, as you have indicated earlier, um, several of the attendees come from uh, foreign countries. Yeah. I think that's where there is a very large cultural difference. For instance, I come from a country where by no means you will ever bargain on the contract, ever. You are given a specific amount, that's what you get, and that's it. In a US context, as you indicated, you have a bit of room for bargaining on different elements as a start date, how much support you might have for technology, and as well as the salary too. Up to a point, of course, you cannot be asking for the moon if you just uh, start as a brand new assistant professor. But it's, it's part of what is expected that you might be bargaining a little bit. So just do it. Otherwise, later on, you might discover that some direct colleagues were much better than you at bargaining and then you feel, you know, eyes too bad, you miss your opportunity. Yeah, so you have uh, make sure that- lose. You have Sorry? nothing to lose, but you have nothing to lose by asking more. Yes, exactly. So they're not exactly. Gonna they're not gonna not hiring you by you know yes. with your you know request because they will tell you this is all we can do and yes. you want to reach yes. that that's what the best strategy you should correct have. that is true 
Sandy, uh, I got a message from uh, Liz and then she got to leave uh, in soon. So why don't we open yeah. questions to the floor, especially uh, from the participants, if you have any specific question to Liz, let's go with, uh, for that first, okay? Raise your hand, now allowed to talk. Have about certain attendees in this room. Okay, I have one. Text. If the if the attendees feel more comfortable typing their questions in a chat, yeah. it's completely fine too. You can put in the Q and A or yeah, we have one. Okay, so Kawamoto, now yeah, please unmute and ask a question, please. Okay. Thank you so much for interesting presentation. And also I'd like to ask one thing. If I, we apply to the community college as lecture, yeah, the process, what kind of process should I should we do? If it is possible. Uh, so Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Uh, it's a very good one. I'm afraid I don't have much experience on uh, the process with community colleges. Uh, there, there is basically a community college in pretty much any city which has uh, also a university. Um, but I'm a little bit, I'm really unfamiliar with the way the process works here. I don't know. What about my colleagues here on the panel? Do you have a better sense of how it works for? community colleges? Well, I, I may add some, cause you know, some of our uh, graduate few years ago, he was not interested in doing research. He was just interested in teaching. So basically community college is for teaching college. So most cases. So you will be asked to provide demo uh, lecture most likely. And then you should highlight more about what courses you've been teaching, you've been taught and then what courses you can develop and what courses you can uh, team teach with others. Teaching, you should highlight, fo uh, focus on teaching and your capability for teaching. Because uh, you know, most of those uh, professorships or the university professor position is three different responsibilities, research, teaching, and service. And the service is service within, within university, within your academic field, and within and uh, service toward the community. But, you know, I think in your case, it will be really important for uh, focus on the teaching mission of the community college. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I think my understanding to get a job in community college is quite easier. That's why, uh, yeah, I would like to ask it, but how about the lecture position of academic university? The process, is it the same? process? Well, I think uh, J1 emphasize on uh, teaching and your quality as a teacher uh, is still very much valid. So yes, overall, the process will be the same. And you're absolutely right to highlight that uh, several um, universities do open positions where the main focus is indeed on teaching. Keep in mind that uh, it's not because you are hired under that kind of position that you're going to be stuck to it forever. We've had a case in my department where someone got hired mostly uh, for teaching uh, purposes, but it turned out he's a very energetic and bright young man, and he decided to slowly develop uh, a, a set of uh, program within a department which have been very successful attracting a lot of new students in a department. So now his position has somewhat shifted to become more of a manager of that particular program he developed. That's one element that I really love from the US academic system. In other words, there is so much flexibility as to how you might be using your time, uh, say five years down the road. There is nothing really stuck in stone uh, when you become a, a member of uh, the US academic community. Thank you so much. It was an interesting answer. Sure, because, my well, pleasure. Yeah, no, I live in Japan, so that's why Japanese um, process and the US process is a totally different. Thank you oh, so much. I totally hear you. I'm from France originally, and I think that we have a lot to learn from the US uh, in terms of how to organize our scholarship and, and uh, academic system uh, back in Europe. So I understand you very well. Thank you. So, yeah, Sandy, there's one more question in the q and I'll read it for all of us. Uh, it's from 
Jung Hwan Kim and he's a PhD candidate in, in the Department of Geography in University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And he stated, thank you for your helpful presentation. During an on-site one-to-one -on, one -on, one -to -one job interview with the faculty members, if there is a little overlap regarding the research field, for example, I'm a quantitative GIS scientist, uh, but the faculty is doing qualitative little uh, quality of critical geography, what can be a good strategy, what can be good strategies for the conversation? In other words, there's a mm -hmm. very little overlap with the faculty you're meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I mean, in my view, I mean, it's a very common situation. Uh, I think it's an excellent question because uh, as you can imagine, you can naturally have much of an overlap with the research of every single faculty member that you are going to meet. So how do you handle that situation? Well, it seems to me that the best strategy is to be asking uh, quite a lot of questions. Uh, so those questions don't necessarily have to be targeted to the scholarship of the person you're meeting. So if it turns out, let's say, as you are entering their office, uh, that person has, let's say, uh, a picture of Colorado and you went to Colorado a while ago, you can start the conversation by indicating, oh, okay, I went to Colorado for that meeting, I enjoyed it. Are you from there, you don't necessarily have to be speaking uh, about pure research as you are getting to know people. Now, at some point, uh, it could be in that situation where indeed uh, there is nothing else to speak about but work and there is no overlap with what you do yourself. In this case, it's a matter of being quite diplomatic. You're not here to be telling somebody uh, the field that I, uh, I represent is more interesting, more important than yours. Instead, here, you could simply choose to, again, ask some questions uh, from that person about what their research is up to. To, how does their research uh, help the local community or what kind of uh, policy implications that might have? Where is the field going down the line? Uh, you know, basic, uh, basic information. Or you can also ask basic questions such as, you know, what is your, um, what is your impression about life in this community, in this city? Uh, you know, when I was myself, uh, job candidate for my second position. I was in Arizona first and in Illinois. When I came to Illinois, one of the questions I had for many of my uh, now colleagues was with respect to the quality of schools, because I have two children and I wanted to make sure that the schools are good. So another way of starting conversation, not focused on research at all, is how do they see life in the community? What's good about it? Are the schools good or other elements that you might care about? Okay. Yeah, just to add one more point to uh, his question. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you already got invitation to the campus, so you don't have much to, uh, overlapping, you know, field in research field with that specific I mean, specific faculty. There's nothing to worry about, in fact, because you know they chose you as one of the three or four candidates. So it means you already qualified in terms of the research focus to what they're looking for. So uh, yeah, as Sandy just mentioned, it's more like you know the personal interaction, not necessarily should be on the research topic always. Okay, and we have a question from Ye Yao, and yeah. I allowed you to talk. Could you? Sure, Go sure. Ahead. Okay, okay. go ahead, Ye. Yeah, thank you so much, professors, for sharing all your experience to me, and I think it's really helpful. And uh, right now, I'm a PhD candidate at Rutgers University. And I do have one question, which is like, what do you think about the paper that I published in the foreign languages rather than English? Should I include them in my CV when I go to the drawer market? Because I feel like if the, for example, the committee member couldn't read it, is that necessary? Yeah, so that's my Okay, question. so it's yeah. a very good question, yeah. And I was in that situation myself. Uh, mm -hmm. The first, uh, I think the first two or three publications I have were in French, uh, that's where I'm from. So what I did is uh, I put them in my CV because they anyway are uh, a proof that you are able to complete a project till the end. Okay. Uh, as I keep telling my students, uh, you know, no, no work is complete until it is published, right? So if you are reaching that point, it's a sign that you are really able to complete uh, work. And I would rather hire someone who has two publications as opposed to someone who has 10 
ongoing manuscript and none of them has actually been um, published. So to be more specific, what I will uh, do in this case, because it's in a foreign language, I will make sure that I will translate the title of uh, the article in English. Mm -hmm. And if you are in a situation where you can easily get access to the impact factor of that foreign journal, uh, it would be great that you report it and also indicate uh, from which site or uh, classifying um, uh, information that impact factor comes from because different uh, places might rank the exact same journal with very different levels. But no, I think uh, it's uh, something that plays for you, uh, definitely not against you. Okay, sure. Thank you so much for your Sure, answer. my pleasure. Yep. Thanks mm -hmm. for coming. <laughs> I see no one asking more questions. We oh, there you go. Ting from University of Ah, Baltimore. Ting, Hi. good to see you. How are you, Professor? You, Thank you. How you are you? Very, very good. Very good. Very good to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Very valuable. Wish I knew that before I started hunting my job. Right <laughs> now, um, I missed the first half of the presentation. I guess we'll get slides somewhere, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It's recorded, so you're gonna have access to everything. Yeah. <laughs> my specific question is on, and you know, um, I think most of your um, this job talk is more talking about the uh, young. <laughs> newer PhD. So people like who, you know, like me already can kind of mid-career already. Any mm -hmm. tips for this kind of situation? Well, I think that uh, one element which is wonderful from the US Academia, and again, I make a big, comp big uh, comparison with the European case. The European case is so that uh, it is not very common over there to be changing um, university uh, at some point in your career. I'm afraid that Europeans are still, maybe with some exceptions that I see in the UK system and the systems in the Netherlands, interestingly, but in my own, in my own country, the expectation is still that uh, whatever job you land on the first place is very, pretty much the place you're gonna still be at when you retire. In a US case, it is not expected that this is what will happen. It is perfectly well understood that because of uh, private or personal or eventually professional circumstances, you start in one university and you end up in another one. I mean, I'm an example of it. I started with uh, Daoshin and, and J12, University of Arizona, the three of us in the mid 2000s. And now each of us is now in a different university. So, so things happen for various reasons. In this case, I still believe that the process we described earlier uh, makes sense. Now you will obviously be in a situation where you will have much more uh, you know, scholarship uh, under your belt in terms of the publication, uh, in terms of uh, the ease at which you can speak about your field and what the future directions will be. But uh, yeah, I think that there is definitely nothing wrong to also be looking at what new opportunities might come, even so you already are in one position somewhere. And also big difference from the European case is that no one will really have a grudge uh, with you about it. It is just perfectly understood that another place is offering something more interesting to you at that stage of your career, and you simply decided to take that opportunity and that's it. So nothing wrong in my view. Daoshin, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there are various reasons. I mean, one very legitimate reasons due to family reasons, right? So you want, if you want to, so if your partner is in a different uh, place, then you want to join him. Or if you feel like another department has a better, it's a better fit, it's a better fit for you. I think it's very, very reasonable for us to look for a different place. So there's nothing wrong about it. No, I completely agree. I mean, when I look back at my own case, I, I was very happy to have uh, Arizona as a place where I started because it really provided me with an environment where uh, the expectations that or I could generate for my work were really fitting what was with what that department was interested in. But as I started to grow a little bit more in terms of uh, scholarship 
and my interest started to shift, it turned out that another place was simply much more suited for what I had in mind. So again, nothing wrong with uh, those shifts uh, from uh, one place to another. It's something that we see regularly in, uh, in the academia in the US. Okay, uh, yeah. Ting, do you have any remark? Oh, I, I first want to thank thank you, everyone. <laughs> I of mean, course. First of all, it's very you know it's, it's very exciting to see everyone here. It feels like return home, that kind of feeling. Right? Very good. <laughs> it's great. And if you have uh, if you have more questions, Ting, don't hesitate to contact us later on. It's not a problem. Okay. And thank you so much. Thank you. Ting. And we have one more question in Q and A. I'll yeah. read it for all of us. So it's from Hun O. Oh is a PhD candidate in the University of Cincinnati and planning department. And his question is, I would like to know if it's common to work in a department that is not a perfect match with my PhD major. For example, a planning PhD applies for a position in geography department. If then, what strategy would you recommend to us? Well, it's a uh, very interesting question here too. And it turned out I am uh, someone who exactly fits that description. So my PhD is in economics. I started my career in a department of geography and regional development. And I'm currently in a department of agricultural economics. So this is one aspect which is also wonderful from the US academic system is that you don't necessarily have that degree of uh, silo as you can see in other countries around the world. And mine is uh, certainly one of them. So they definitely at this stage are going to hire you because you are a wonderful fit for the question and the kind of techniques they want you to be teaching. So do not feel that you are at any form of disadvantage if the background you have in terms of the field is any different from what they are interested in. And then on top of that, it turned out that a lot of different departments are at the end of the day working on fairly similar questions. I mean, I am currently working on questions of climate change impact is definitely the kind of question that uh, you see addressed in business school, economics, uh, urban planning, geography, natural resources department. I, you know, there's, there are so many other places that could be interested in uh, this particular topic. So the field per se doesn't really mean much to me. Yeah, just to add one more point, uh, another personal experience, I'm working for the School of Public Policy and my background is in PhD in regional planning and master in urban planning. But I describe myself as regional scientist. And of course, we do this analytical work for the you know, practical problems. And then as an output, we produce the policy implications and that's what the School of Public Policy was looking for. So think about, you know, I'm not necessarily in the theoretical policy or public affairs, but they were looking for somebody that they can hire to, you know, make their program more multifaceted and the more applicability for their students. And, and in terms of research, I think you know, there's nothing to worry about, especially if you clearly demonstrate how your work can be applied for different and build a collaborative work around that program and within your university and across the different disciplines. But one part, sometimes you'll be asked to teach some courses in the public policy. For example, in my example, let's say you are applying for a job in department geography and which you never taught as a planning PhD student, but still, you know, that's why you need to learn more about their curriculum when you go for a job interview. You need to understand what's going on with their current. Uh, I mean, if it is a big program, there are many different opportunities to, to, to teach you the different types of courses. And in my case, our undergrad program was the two joint program when I first got here. One was a public affair, the other one was a environmental studies. So these two programs didn't get along quite well. So when I was hired, the questions that I always get, I'm teaching both sides. I was teaching, you know, environmental economics course. I was teaching uh, policy related courses and always the same question I get from both sides of the faculty. So are you on the ENV side or PUA side? Okay, in the end, what happened within just one or two years later, they just merged it perfectly. Some faculty left and then now we have only one uh, undergrad program called urban studies. 
and I'm in charge of that urban studies program. So they have a reason to hire you and then you can show what your plan is and then how you see this uh, collaborative opportunity, both in uh, research and teaching. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions or comments? If well, not, in this case, J1, thank you so much for organizing this. Yeah, you're the organizer. Thank you. No, Thanks, no, no. no yeah. Thank you, of course. You, you took know. care of everything. Daoshin, it's always a pleasure to see you. And yeah, especially yeah. Thank, you. thank you all. Yeah, thank you all the attendees for this session. And, and as far as I understand, we plan to offer different types of professional development workshop on a slightly different topic for the next year. And of course, as I promised, this will be shared on the WRSA YouTube channel. Please feel free to share with your colleagues and watch it together and then bring more colleagues for the next year's meeting in Scottsdale. And in fact, you know, the virtual meeting is an easier way to join, but you know, if we meet us and if we meet other colleagues in person, that's, they have other comparative advantage with that. You know, you will build your network, you'll build your collegiability in the field of regional science. Please, please join us. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Okay, thank Bye. you. Bye.